um, as the organizers of tonight's event, Claudette Lovensé, Michelle Duchesneau, Kabira Mojo, Vitaly Goffman, and I, Justin Cordillan, wish to say good evening and welcome to the Biking in Montreal panel discussion 2015. Bonsoir et bienvenue à la table ronde des lois Montréal 2015. Cet événement a été organisé par Claudette Levinson, Michel Duchesneau, Vitaly Goffman, Jasper Perdillon et moi-même Kelly Hormetou. This panel is brought to you by Concordia University, the Concordia Student Union, the Political Science Student Association, the School of Community and Public Affairs Student Association, and the School of Community and Public Affairs, who celebrates their 35th anniversary this year. And all to whom we would like to say thank you for making this event possible. We are pleased to have our panelists, as well as our moderator for this event. Nous sommes heureux d'avoir nos panélistes ainsi que notre modérateur pour cette année. So our moderator is Alex Magalas. Alex is a Montreal-based educator and community organizer. He is the coordinator of the Personal and Cultural Enrichment Program, PACE, in the School of Continuing Studies at McGill University. He holds the MA in Educational Studies from Concordia University, and his research is on technological literacy in autonomous committees, communities of practice. His MA thesis, titled Power Up, is a bike-powered exploration of the intersection of technology, community, and self-reliance. He is an affiliate of the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling at Concordia University, and sits on the boards of directors of the Center for Community Organizations, COCO, where he previously worked as an organizational change facilitator from 2007 to 2011. Our panelist, Ahab Salem, is the Saint Laurent Borough Councillor for the Normand McLaren District. Mr. Salem is also a member of the Montreal Executive Committee, responsible for transportation, and a member of the City of Montreal's Council, as well as the Agglomeration Council. Mr. Salem sits on the board of the Communauté Metropolitaine de Montréal and is the president of the City's Taxi Office. Since the 23rd January 2014, he has been appointed on the Metropolitan Transport Agency Board of Administrators. Throughout his career, Mr. Salem has held various positions in the Montreal community, in particular as a member of the Commission, a member of the Commission sur le Développement Économique et Urbain, as Associate Advisor in Culture, Heritage and Design, and Associate Advisor in Communities of Diverse Backgrounds. He has also been active in the Saint Laurent community since 2009. He is particularly interested in issues pertaining to social responsible economic development. He is involved with the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Saint Laurent and is a member of Board of Directors of Cégep Saint Laurent. Mr. Salem holds two bachelor degrees, one in microbiology from Université de Montréal and the other in business administration from HEC Montréal. He is passionate about business, which came from running a small business for 15 years before going into politics. So our next panelist is Marianne Chiguer. Elected for the first time in November 2013, Marianne Chiguer represents the De Lopinier district. There she serves on the planning advisory committee and is responsible among other issues of sustainable development for sports and recreation and entertainment animation of public space. In regards to Projet Montréal, she manages the cycling records, greening, and urban agriculture. A mother of two young children, Marianne is a long-time activist for the greening of her neighborhood, for active, trans for active transport, and for common traffic. A graduate in geography and education, Marianne is an urban cyclist who is actively working, among other things, on the recognition of biking in all four seasons. Our next panelist is Kevin Mano. Kevin Mano is jointly appointed in the McGill School of Environment and Department of Geography. His research focuses on urban transportation as a way to understand urban sustainability and social justice. He studies how the transportation needs of disadvantaged populations and issues of social equity can be integrated into land use and transportation policies. He uses mixed methods to examine the processes and outcomes of transport planning at various scales. 
from the local to regional. Dr. Manuk has researched extensively on travel behavior and mode choice decision making as well as the physical and social determinants and barriers to using active transportation. And finally, as our panelists, we have Bartek Komorowski. Bartek has been working with Villa Quebec since 2010 as project leader in the research department. Since earning the degree of Masters of Urban Planning from McGill University in 2007, he has been involved in numerous research and consulting projects on cycling and active transportation for clients across Canada. With Villa Quebec, Bartek has worked on active transportation policy, cycling infrastructure, master planning, and street design projects for the cities of Ottawa, Tor Toronto, Quebec, and Montreal, as well as government agencies such as the Communauté Métropolitaine de Montréal, the Agence Métropolitaine de Transport, the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario, the National Capital Commission, and Infrastructure Canada. He has also worked on cycling infrastructure with suburban rural communities in Quebec and Ontario. Finally, Bartek lives in Montreal's Villeray district and is a year-round year bicycle commuter. You can follow him on Twitter at CyclistBartek. <laughs> We are pleased to have a kiosk participants for this event. Um, these include OPA Action Guardian, Coalition Vélo Montréal, NDG Cyclist, and Pedestrian Association, Sustainable Concordia, Allego, Polyculture, the Concordia Community Solidarity, Co-op Bookstore, Bike to Farm, The Right to Move, Flat Bike Collective, Importing Lee, and Cyclopat. <laughs> Finally, we are all pleased to have you um, all here for this event. Thank you for being patient. I now like, would like to kindly ask our moderator, Mr. Alex Magulas, to continue from here. But first, please assist me in, <laughs> in welcoming them all by giving them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Uh, I just want to say that it's it's a great privilege to be here this evening. Uh, this is an important conversation, uh, and given the weather that we're getting outside right now, I can I'd like to to, to, to propose that it's especially timely since uh, I dare say most of us are going to be on our bikes uh, around the, the streets of Montreal within uh, a, a week or two. Uh, is there anybody here who's already on their bikes? Show of hands. They're all amazing. Uh, I've got a hernia coming in right now, so depending on what my, my surgeon tells me next week, uh, it might be a, a few more weeks before I join you. So, um, so we're we're here to talk about uh, we're here to talk about safety and social equity and policy and infrastructure development in Montreal uh, as it relates to to, to biking uh, as a practice and as a culture. Um, just to maybe go over some uh, some details of how this is going to go down. We're going to start the exchange by, uh, by asking our panelists to look um, at the, the future of biking infrastructure uh, in the city. We're, we're going to give the, the first crack uh, uh, at the question to, to Monsieur Salem. Um, uh, Madame Giga will then follow up, and then we'll, uh, we'll hear from, uh, from, from Kevin Minot and, uh, and Bartek Moravsky on the question. And uh, so this will take about, uh, about 20 minutes. We're going to cap it to about five minutes each. I think Michelle is going to keep our panelists uh, on track, uh, not Michelle, and, uh, and, um, and then after that, we're going to open it up and, and start to have an earnest uh, exchange with all of you. Uh, one of the things that uh, the committee did a really fantastic job at, at doing leading up to the conversation this evening was to really start to build an awareness um, and a discussion on social media. And so we've, uh, we, we've gotten a hold of a generated list of uh, you know, about 15, 20 questions that have been asked so far. And so after we've heard from the panelists, we're gonna go to those questions, you know, those really hard-hitting, important questions that people have asked, and we'll ask them to respond to that. Uh, and after they've had a chance to address it, then we're gonna start to pass them out, the mic around uh, amongst all of you, and then we're gonna have a, an open exchange. Um, Maybe just a couple of logistics before we dive in. Uh, the, the bathrooms are around the corner. Uh, I think there's some snacks that, that's still kicking around, so feel free to have some. Um, and the goal is going to be to end the evening by about 8.30. 
Okay, all good. And certainly when we're when we're talking with one another, uh, Michelle, I hope it's okay if people uh, express themselves in the language of their choice, whether that's English or French. And then, if need be, we'll do some uh, some on the spot Montreal translation. Uh, maybe before just before I hand it over, I'm, I'm going to take a, the liberty to uh, editorialize a little bit. Um, as as uh, folks said, I'm, I'm with the Center for Community Organizations, COCO, and uh, we have a, a, an exhibit going on right now called um, Quebec on the Move, uh, Quebec en Mouvement. It's looking at the history of social struggle in the province of Quebec. Uh, the exhibit is, is going on here uh, at Concordia uh, for another week um, at, at the art gallery downstairs. Is that correct, Aaron? Library. No, in the library building. There we go. So feel free to go and have a look. And uh, I just wanted to do a little plug, so thank you for bearing with me. So now I'm going to pass it over to the, the panelists. So, Monsieur Sarem, can you tell us a little bit about the city's proposed plan for the future of biking infrastructure? <laughs> so we're not talking about microbiology here. Uh, just like I'm going to go back to 2008. Uh, remember like when we did, uh, when we voted our uh, first transportation plan for the city of Montreal, we had in mind to double the bike paths in the city up to 800 kilometers. This year with the plan that we have, by this year probably we're going to hit 300, uh, 730. So we're around probably 90% of what we, uh, what we were planning to have by 2018. We believed in the beginning, you know, in bicycling, and I think the last administration, they start, they had a good, they did a good job, and we're continuing on this, and we're bonifying, like, you know, the, the, uh, the plan that we had. This year, we voted an extra 600 kilometers. It's going to reach, like, we can, in, within 10, re, 10 years from now, 10, 12 years from now, we're going to reach around 12,080 kilometers of bike paths in the city of Montreal. This, this, like you know, this uh, enhancing of this, uh, this enhancing happened with the boroughs. We worked with the boroughs uh, to to put in plan uh, to put in place this plan. So this is like you know we want Montreal to be the first city in, in bicycling in, in, in the world. We're now I think we're the six six uh, cities in the world. So we're aiming to be like really on the top. Um, we're working on really to make sure that the city it's uh, it's, it's like it's a place it's a friendly it's, it's gonna be a, f a friendly city for biking a friendly city for it's, we aim to have like a, a secure bike paths a, we, a comfortable one so people they can take their bikes from any place from home to to their work from home to the to any metro station uh, to any train station uh, and it's gonna be safe and I know we work with mo with some with some organization here on, on different projects. Uh, I can see people from uh, Vandon Danger Zone. But, you know, we're, we were working on this uh, for the for, and you know we have we work with uh, how can I say it? It's our participation. We work like you know all together with with the communities uh, on this issue. You know we have a bike uh, community in the city of Montreal too. Uh, we have. Uh, Direction de Santé Publique, we have the police with us, we have uh, Coalition Vélo Québec, we have Vélo Québec with us on, a, on, a, on this committee, where we can, change, we can change ideas, we can talk about like, how we can make the city more friendly for bike, uh, for bike and especially more secure for, uh, for, uh, for the cyclists. So uh, this, this year we put in place to the four season uh, map, uh, so we Last year we had around 42 kilometers. This year we have we put in place 260. I know it's not perfect. I know there is a lot to do, but at least there is. A, we start with with with, with, uh, with, with this uh, with this project, and it's gonna be much better, like you know, for the years to come. At least we put something this year that uh, for the first time we have 260 kilometers of bike paths in during the. During the this winter it was it wasn't like the real winter to, to challenge us on that because we had re really the worst winter ever. Um, but we're we're planning to have better like bike paths cleaned uh, in the city. So um, that's uh, we have just like some measures we're putting in place. Uh, I would like uh, we're gonna talk about them like you know later on the, during the discussion. They told me I have two minutes. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Monsieur Salem. Thank you, thank you, Monsieur Salem. Madame Gigal, what would Projet Montréal like to see happen? Um, what we want to see happen. Uh, you know, when we're talking about bicycle, we can, we can see it at many different levels or many different scales. Uh, of course, we can talk about uh, rebuilding a very specific uh, intersection by, for making it more s safer or just bike, more bike friendly or adding it some kind of biking infrastructures. But we can also go uh, a little higher on the whole global issue and think the question was how we see uh, biking in the future in Montreal, and I think this this question can't be uh, studied and discussed on itself because biking is a way of transportation. So uh, we have to think in a more global way about how we do go around in in a, a big city like Montreal. If we want to have more people on bike then we have to uh, have less people in their cars first because the whole way of life that we have uh, developed for the last 50 or so years is all centered on that idea of the car solo way of getting around in the city. So we cannot push and push on having more bike infrastructures and thinking that they're going to be safe and comfortable if we don't change that way of thinking, if we don't uh, take away some space, some of that huge amount of space that was given to the car solo way of getting around in a city. So, uh, and this implies uh, the, the development of a very good public transportation system too. Because if you want to convince somebody to uh, n not use the solo car as a way of getting around, you have to provide this person with good uh, alternatives. And we don't, you don't convince somebody to get rid of uh, his car and to change his way of getting around if those alternatives are not uh, attractive to the person. It has to be better than what he, he lives every day in you know, his or her car going around solo. So to me, thinking about having very good bike infrastructures also go needs, we need to address the whole transport issue at the whole metropolitan scale by building a very good public transportation service. And uh, on the, at the same time, building a very good uh, biking infrastructures, and then the alternatives will be attractive to people. And then it's not going to be a big political cost to come and say to this intersection, to this street, if we want to have better infrastructures for biking, if we want, if we want to make them really comfortable and really useful, we have to remove some space that was given to cars, to parking or a, a road lane, and give it to the bike. And doing this, if we provide people with good alternatives, then it's not going to be that hard politically to do so. Because that's, that's the big issue now. We're always confronting, confront, confronting, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, the people in their cars because we want to take space away to them. Uh, yeah, anyway, you understand. <laughs> and they don't like it, and we can understand because they don't have a lot of other alternatives. That so that was the main idea I wanted. I wanted to start with first to say that we need to think it more globally than just bike bike because it's not going to work. <laughs> So maybe we'll hand it over to, to, to Kevin Manok. Could, could you share with us, really, uh, based on, on your research and your, and your work at McGill, your perspective on the city's plan? Sure. Um, go 
first of all, I'll say it's great to, to see such a big turnout for an event like this, and, and it's, I'm, I'm both very excited and a bit uncomfortable. I, I usually talk in, in very much sort of academic settings, and, and now I'm sort of somewhere between an, an advocate or an activist and, and an academic, so I'll, I'll try to keep it straight, which is who's talking about them. Um, but a couple things I'll say that's, I mean, both the two previous speakers have brought up some really interesting points about, um, about what's being built, and but I think there's an important thing to, to talk about in terms of, of how we're sort of measuring and understanding um, what a good what good infrastructure is and what we should sort of um, use as, as indicators. And um, I'm very sort of heartened to what Madame Lars is talking about this sort of systems based way of thinking that it's not simply um, looking at um, you know how long is the is the is the are the cycle paths, but you know what are you really making it better to easier to be a cyclist than, than to be a motorist in the city. I think that's something that's really important to, to understand. And um, and it's, it's interesting because I, I, I teach an urban transport um, policy course at McGill. And just this week, we're looking at um, one of the readings was, um, I can't remember the full title, but it's basically about talking about carrots and sticks kind of metaphor about how we get people out of their, their cars. And, and exactly as, as I met Elder, who I was just saying, it's, it's, it's not so simple just to provide infrastructure. Um, it's, it's to make other, there's, there's the kind of stick metaphor in terms of making it more difficult um, to drive. So there's very big questions we need to ask ourselves about, about parking policy, about, um, about public transport system, about you know, where money is, is, is going towards in the city. And, um, and, uh, and, and just you're making it safer. I mean, again, it's, it's not simply building, building infrastructure, it's, it's making it a, a more viable alternative, which I think is, is very, very central to this, this way of thinking. And, and looking beyond sort of the, you know, other things we can do, it's, it's not simply making the bike paths, it's, it's you know, awareness, having drivers be more aware. Um, I think a big part of safety is very obviously um, motorists expecting, you know, knowing where cyclists are, knowing how they act, having sort of both everyone on the street having a, a sort of code of conduct where everyone knows what each other are doing, um, not simply, you know, making sure that the cyclists are over in their own little path, but making sure when we are interacting on the streets that people are safe, that, it, that it's clear um, with what's going on. And I guess that's a bit of all to say for my final my intro remarks. Lastly, Mr. Komorowski, could you share with us maybe your thoughts and that of Vito Quebec? <coughs> well, um, yeah, it's sort of sometimes hard to separate my thoughts from those of my organization. Uh, but uh, <coughs> I would generally say that, of course, Vito Quebec welcomes the city's uh, initiative to, to, to grow the bicycle network. Um, and uh, of course, we are also participating. We're, we're at the committee, and, and we're providing uh, uh, input into how this, this should be done. Um, I, what I would say in general is that what we've seen so far is the city has put out a map. It's, 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 there are lines on a map. And I think what's important to me is to see how those lines will be actually translated into infrastructure, and what kind of infrastructure it will be. Um, when you look at streets uh, in Montreal, uh, a lot of them today are very much uh, overwhelmingly designed for car circulation. Um, the, the car circulation portion of the street is 80%, 90% of the width of the street. Um, so I guess going forward, what I'm interested in seeing is um, just as we, since World War II have engineered Montreal to be to make more room for cars, whether we're going to truly start engineering it to make systematically now to make more room for, for bicycles. Um, and not only for bicycles, but um, there's actually this notion that's increasingly popular now, which is talking about making complete streets. So a city street is not just a conduit for vehicles, it's a conduit for people. And so that we stop thinking of transportation as, as the number of vehicles and the speed of vehicles, but rather the number of people who are going through and what is the best way to move uh, the most, the greatest number of people. Um, and I think that the bicycle, among other things, among uh, the other modes of transportation should be thought of in that, in that way. Um, and this is not something I haven't seen this yet. I don't think the city is 
fully embraced this kind of way of thinking of, trans of, of transportation as being a system for moving people, uh, first and foremost. And then, so first we set goals in terms of how we want to move people, how many people we want to move, and then we find the best way to, uh, to, 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 to do it. So, um, and I think that sort of uh, complements what, what uh, Marianne and, and Kevin said, that, that it's important to think of this in this sort of systemic, systemic way. So, um, so there you go. So I think, again, um, I think uh, going forward, um, I'm very, I'm looking forward to seeing Montreal being transformed, uh, you know, f uh, for, uh, into a place that is more welcoming to all ways of getting around, not just, uh, not just a, using a car. Now, as I mentioned before, we got a lot of really great uh, questions submitted to us by, uh, by, by people out there in the world via the medium of social media. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a couple of questions to, uh, to the panel. Um, we'll, we'll give you folks a chance to really talk this out a little bit. Uh, and then fairly quickly, we're going to move to really taking questions from, from the audience. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll move fairly quickly towards that. And then if we need to afterwards, then we'll go back to some of the questions from out there. Um, but first, what I'd like to ask um, is, uh, is, 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 is a couple of questions related to access to the infrastructure. Um, we have a question here that, uh, that speaks to me personally. I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, the existing cycling infrastructure is not accessible for all people, namely women biking with children and for people who are disabled. Are there various populations, are these various populations consulted? And if so, what are some of the propositions to enhance the usage capability for various users? And if not, if they're not consulted, is this something that is in the plan before investing in new infrastructure that is not accessible to all? Monsieur Sadem. Well, you know, there's two, uh, how can I say it? It's, there's two, uh, two different uh, category of cyclists. There's the people that you, they use the bike paths to go to work, which is like, you know, on, they use it on utility base. And there's some people, they, um, they, uh, they use it just like, you know, as a recreation. So we had this dilemma at the city at one time, like, you know, how can we, uh, the infrastructure that we have to do, is it gonna be more for people, for using, using the infrastructure for utilities or for recreation? But, just like to, do, to go back on, on um, as, as you said, on, on the accessibility. In 2011, we had a commission at the city hall that uh, they held like a public consultation. And they had some recommendation. And last December at the city, we voted a new bylaw that allows all the, uh, the it allows the, the people with reduced mobility to use the bike paths. Now, it, it, like you know, it was prohibited before. Now, at the city at least, we, any, uh, any, uh, any person who's handicapped, he can go on the, on the bike path, and he can run on the, on the bike path. And this is like, you know, we, have, we want to have a city like, you know, which is inclusive, inclusive for everyone. And this is like, you know, an act that we took, uh, we put in place just like last December. Uh, and we had uh, a unanimous vote, vote at, the city, at the city council. So it was like something that we, we believe in and we, we would like to make it more accessible. Now for sure, like, you know, when we think on, on infrastructure that we have actually, we know there is some, uh, some infrastructure that fall. Uh, they, we, we have, it's jammed, some, some places are jammed, you know, some, some bike paths are jammed. So we're thinking on, on putting in place like more uh, preferential, preferential measures, taking some streets and changing them into just like, you know, a velo route, which is like the, the, the bike path, the bikes, they have priority on the streets. Um, you know, like we're rethinking the whole model that we put in place in 2008. And I think by the next uh, plan of transportation that we're gonna put in place, I guess, I hope at least we're gonna all participate in the elaboration of this plan. Uh, hopefully we're gonna see you all like bringing your new ideas because like we're changing the city, we're changing as you said before, as Marianne said, we have the place today for this, for, for uh, like for the cars and the, and the streets. 
we want to change this, but we don't have the resources to change it like within two years. So the plan is to change it bit by bit, step by step, and make it more safer and make it more uh, <coughs> comfortable and especially like you know make it accessible to anyone. Uh, I think you know the the the, the will is there. The, the goal we know where we're going and we all discuss like you know at the high committee let's say on how we can bring it to another level, make it better for for everyone. And hopefully like you know you know it's, it's something we can be like, you know on. Ongoing. It's not something you know. We can decide like within two years we're gonna see uh, uh, Montreal changing. We're gonna see it changing step by step. Hopefully within five or ten years we're gonna see this difference uh, in the city. Thank you. Um, would another member of the panel like to comment on issues of accessibility and biking infrastructure, and also the the piece about uh, consultation of groups who aren't necessarily afforded you uh, the opportunity to, to have access to the infrastructure? Uh, yes, well, one thing that I learned very early on when I was in urban planning school was that, um, and I've never thought of this before, but most people who design infrastructure are, uh, are civil engineers and men who are generally middle-aged men. And uh, so they, a lot of infrastructure has been actually designed and dimensioned for uh, middle-aged men and, you know, and the sort of the psychological and physical profile of a middle-aged man. Um, so, now there's a very conscious effort uh, for people who follow, um, uh, you know, dialogue about the discourse about urbanism and so on. There's often now references to something called eight to eighty design, which means uh, it's it's aiming to design infrastructure streets which are which anyone from eight years old to eighty years old can use unaccompanied. Um, and <clears throat> I think that the, uh, much of the current infrastructure we have for bicycles um, is not quite there yet. It's, uh, uh, to put it mildly, I mean, uh, you know, probably most <coughs> people will let their children use many of the bikeways that we have. And I think also elderly people, for example, wouldn't feel necessarily comfortable using them. So um, I think going forward, uh, what we'll need is is, is more ambitious uh, design standards to, uh, to to make the bike path accessible to people regardless of their age and regardless of their gender, um, and also and, and for that matter, you know, also if somebody's carrying a child, you know, that they feel safe on uh, on bicycle infrastructure. And uh, by the way, I, I wanted to say that I personally really support the idea. Of that Monsieur Sena mentioned of making these vidal rues, which are sort of streets which are primarily thought of, systematically thought of for bicycles at every intersection. There's some consideration for how bicycles will go through, on which cars are still welcome, but but that are I think that's a that's an interesting an interesting way to go forward. Can I add something? Absolutely. Okay, just like to tell you, uh, at the city, yes, we have a middle-aged man, but they're directors. We have people on their bikes uh, that they're planning the bike path is the city. So this is like, you know, I know there's a lot of people, they think that, you know, we have the planning uh, that happens with the 50 years old man, like, you know, but it's not the case. Uh, we have people who on their bikes for uh, like, you know, all year long going to their job on the bikes. So this is, I, I, want, I want to trust the mention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yes. Um, I, I, I can imagine that many, many of our engineers who are planning the whole, whole bike infrastructures, they also do bike uh, around the city, but yet maybe they're in their 30s or 40s and uh, very athletic and they feel comfortable riding the saint Surbain uh, bike path, for example, which is not the case of that mother with the kids, you know. <laughs> so, uh, um, as as Bartek said, if if a bike infrastructure is is com comfortable, if I can let my eventually 11 years old son go and ride that bike path, then we can assume that it's it's for everyone. But it's it's still not the case. Uh, so, 
I really do uh, agree also on uh, the idea of the vélo rue uh, because if, if yes if if in some places we need to really build build uh, protected bike lines uh, if we want to make them comfortable for everyone perhaps we'll need to make them a lot wider so that the faster cyclists could pass the slower ones which is absolutely absolutely not the case right now and because it's very uh, it's very expensive to build those wide bike lanes then having a good cycling it infrastructures on the whole city means that we have to do a lot of traffic counting and traffic reduction and then all the local streets become very biker friendly uh, for kids and for family i thought the question was funny because i, I didn't understand why uh, a woman biking with children would feel less comfortable than a father biking with children, but that, that was it. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> I should have let it be. So, yeah. Right. Um, well, I mean, this is, a, this is a really good and difficult question, I think, in terms of, but I think it brings up, one thing we haven't really mentioned is this, I guess Barclay kind of brought that up, but, but in terms of, there's kind of this question of, of who's an expert and who knows and who plans and who's who's participating and and you know one could actually argue that the four year old man is an expert and knows what what is best for, for, for people psyching around. And the question that we haven't really addressed is is this kind of second part of the question in terms of you know, has this input actually been um, been requested or, or been brought into the, the planning process, which I think is it would be very interesting in terms of knowing where uh, people who need either you know different types of, of infrastructure, um, different types of services, um, are women or men um, biking with their children in certain areas of the city that they would need um, different types of infrastructure. Um, but I guess a genuine question, well two genuine questions I have is, you know, is, is has this input been brought into this decision making? And I'd be curious too if, uh, especially maybe Bartek might know, what other cities um, have really done this well in terms of, in terms of this AD, Type of you know are there cities who do a really good job of making sure you know, young children, pregnant women, um, and, and seniors all feel comfortable on on cycling infrastructure? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that uh, I think that there aren't very many North American examples. Uh, there are certainly examples, many examples in Europe, where the where bicycle infrastructure is thought of quite differently than it is. Hopefully we'll get there someday. But uh, but where bicycle infrastructure is thought of as almost in the way that we think of a sidewalk. So generally sidewalks are safe places. We don't ask ourselves too many questions about is this sidewalk safe to walk on? Is it stressful to walk on? Uh, and I don't think most people ask too many questions about letting, you know, about walking with their child on a sidewalk. Um, so, so they conceive of bicycle infrastructure as being like a sidewalk. Um, so systematically on every single street, that doesn't mean there's a protected bike path, it doesn't mean that there are bike lanes, but there's some consideration of how are cyclists going to use this street. And, and also in particular at intersections, So, uh, which is something we ha still haven't uh, done that much work on in Montreal, but it's systematically thinking of how is this cyclist going to cross this intersection. Um, so in the way that we do for pedestrians. So I mean, we, we systematically consider every single intersection for pedestrians. We don't, we don't forget that to put crosswalks and lights for pedestrians. So uh, we should do the same for, for cyclists if we really want you know, more people to, to use that as a way to get around. In line with that, actually, I'll, I'll shift to another question. Um, and this is really a question that, that is about the created infrastructure. Um, the question is, there are various countries such as Colombia and Denmark that have implemented legislative and infrastructure programs which help to equalize transport modal status. What has Montreal done to ensure equal status of motor vehicles, pedestrians, public transport users, as well as cyclists? Monsieur Senate. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, just like 
you're 40 years old, you're still young, yeah? Just, uh, <laughs> I wanted to mention it. Because <laughs> you were talking about 40 years old, like if uh, it's really an old man. <laughs> I want to read, like, you know, exactly what, 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 what we have in the transportation plan uh, of the city of Montreal that we adopted in 2008. We said, like, you know, Montreal recognized bicycle transportation as a core component of its current transportation network and intends to innovate by deploying new measures capable of further promoting active forms of transportation. Just like to tell you that, you know, we, we know that, you know, bicycling, it's, it's, it's a core component. And we know, we, we call it in French, it's un cocktail de transport. It's part of this cocktail. It's part it's, it's, it's mainly, I think, uh, this is the place that we had the most, the most increase in Lanquette uh, origin destination that we had lately. We had the most increase of transportation of, uh, of population. It was like, the increase was like 15% on bicycling. And I think, if I may interject, 54% increase. 54, you're right. 54%. Since 2008 to 2013, 54% more trips being made daily by bicycle in Montreal. Uh, and this is like uh, you right, 54 percent, and this 54 percent, it's like because we put in place infrastructure, infrastructures, and we we're changing the culture in the city. We we have to focus on a lot of on on education, uh, how to share the street better. And this is like you know, it's a long way to. Uh, we're asking. We did some some campaign of sensitizing. Uh, lately, the campaign de sensibilisation avec Transport Québec. We had last year. We did this on Dory. This year, we're going to continue on Dory. We, we know last year we had two people they died because of the Anglomar. So this year, we're in the campaign that it's coming. We're, we're going to focus on this issue too. Uh, it's we're working now on the uh, the changement du code sécurité routière, the high the highway safety code that uh, the, the government they decide that. To, to change, to put some measures, some extra measures. And this is because of Montreal. This is because like, of what's happening in Montreal. Uh, and the city, we're going to be there. We're going to put the memoir. We're gonna, uh, we, at, at the end, we're going to react to all the recommendations, because we are the people that we're going to implement in these recommendations. That they're coming from the government. So we're going to be there uh, to, to, to make things better. I think, you know, we're, we're not perfect, but at least we have, uh, we would like to, we're rethinking things, we're working all together in an inclusive way to make things better in the city, better for everyone, better including the cyclists. Don't forget that the cyclist can be one day a pedestrian, the other day a driver, and like, we have to sensitize all these people and to educate all these people that, you know, sharing the road is, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of everyone. Um, if uh, if you ask me if there's some equal stages uh, between motor vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists, I well, it's nothing against you personally, uh, I have, but to me in Montreal, there's I acknowledge the efforts that are made, and they, no small efforts. Is, uh, every effort is, is good, but there's still, to me, a very long way to go to achieve any kind of e equity in, in, in that, uh, in, yeah. Uh, for, for example, well, you, you were saying that uh, you want, uh, Bartek was saying that uh, cycling lanes should be, uh, think just like sidewalks are, uh, and that at, at every corner we have a special uh, light for pedestrians and uh, to speak about pedestrians, this is still not the case. There are many uh, intersections who, if they don't have lights for pedestrians when they should be there, they're necessary or if there are some, uh, the, the, time, the timer is way too short for somebody which is not an healthy 40 year old athletic man. <laughs> uh, if you're elderly, if you're young with small kids, you don't have time to cross. So that's uh, to speak about the pedestrians. There's still a, a long way to go to, uh, to have them feel really safe on, on sidewalks. Uh, and as for 
bicycle. Uh, there are many uh, very recent projects, very important projects, in, uh, and some smaller in Montreal that reflect very well that in iniquity. Is that correct? Um, I think, for example, uh, the Maisonneuve bike lane, which I took to come here, it's so frustrating. You always stop at every intersection. And when, even when you have the green light, you have to be very careful because there are cars turning and potentially cutting your, 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 your ride. So was this bike lane really thought uh, for, for cyclists? I'm, I'm not sure. I think that more compromise should have been made uh, between the car uh, Saint fluidity and uh, the, 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 the bike, uh, the people on bike. Um, I also think about the Bonaventure, L'Entrée Bonaventure, which was a very good uh, project that is now uh, going on, the whole uh, Bonaventure University part of the city, I don't know if you heard about it, that is completely rebuilt, now being rebuilt. Uh, it's huge and there's nothing for a bicycle there. So it was a good opportunity to make a strong statement that we are a very bike-friendly city, which is uh, lost now. Uh, maybe a, a last one, a very recent one, uh, the Rachel uh, bike lane at the intersection of Sherbrooke and P9. Will That whole intersection is being uh, re uh, rebuilt uh, and we had a straight bike lane going there, and now you have to stop, to turn, to stop, to turn. Mm. Nobody's going to do that. We all agree on that. Bikers are going to go through that small little park, which is weird. So it, it was not thought in an equity uh, state of mind with, for, for, for bicycle, for people going on bicycle. It was thought first for cars, mm. I think. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, maybe I won't say how old I am, but I definitely don't think I'm as old. But, but, uh, but a couple things. The um, it's another good question. It's a hard question again because you, when you look at Colombia and, and Denmark and, and the Netherlands, for example, there's these countries and, and particular cities have done such a great job at this that it's, it's hard to sort of it's, it's hard to compare Montreal to these. And, and make Montreal look bad. It's not a very fair comparison because I think, as Marianne just said, uh, I think the city is doing a lot of, of great things. So obviously, we're talking about things that can be improved, but uh, but it is great to be in a city that is taking it so seriously. Um, I mean, one thing, for example, what I was just thinking about is the, um, like, especially in Colombia, you had a very, very, very strong sort of top-down um, vision in terms of really completely changing. The transport system. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard this the quote from Enrique Penalosa, the, the, the ex mayor of Bogota, who um, I think I'm getting the quote right, but basically said something along the lines of, you know, an advanced society is not one in which the, the poor people drive cars, it's one in which the rich people use transit. And, and it's you know, completely changed the way, you know, the whole sort of that could be looking in terms of who's using what modes. And, you know, but again, it's very, very, very strong leadership, very strong top-down vision in a sense, the opposite of what I was just talking about before about um, participating and, and, and bringing in the voices. There's a very strong um, leadership in terms of saying we're going to change the way we get around in this city, um, to make, make bikes, make pedestrians, and make, um, um, make public transport a more viable option for everyone. And it was really completely revolutionized in terms of, you know, um, looking at these kind of social justice and equity issues in terms of making sure that bike lanes were equally distributed throughout the city and, and so on. So um, yeah, just to reiterate, I mean, it's, I think Montreal is making a lot of moves in the right direction, and, and but I think there's these these places like Bogota, Colombia, and the Netherlands, and Denmark who are doing such a good job that it should be um, sort of inspiration for, for people in the city to look at. We really need to be better. Well, since the question is about policy also, um, if I may make a few policy suggestions for the city, um, a couple of things. Uh, so for example, we've been talking about this issue of uh, removing space from cars and, you know, and, and giving the space to pedestrians and to cyclists. Uh, this can be very politically 
uh, a very politically loaded uh, thing. Um, so what the city could do for, uh, in terms of policies, uh, uh, for example, Copenhagen has for over 40 years had a policy of systematically removing 1% of parking spaces per year. If you remove 1% of parking per year, uh, year to year, people are not going to really notice. But after 40 years, you have 40% <laughs> less parking space. So, so as Monsieur Salem said, and I think quite rightly, is we're not going to change Montreal to a, a, a bicycle and pedestrian utopia overnight. Uh, however, uh, or, I mean, I don't even think we aim to make it a bike or pedestrian utopia. However, you know, systematically putting in place policies, systematic policies. Another I I idea which <coughs> I think is now uh, the city's intention, but we haven't really done a very good job on, is uh, whenever we do major road work, so if we change, even just change the asphalt on a street, or if we rebuild the sewers <coughs> under a street, that is a great opportunity to change that street. And we miss these opportunities. We dig up a street, we do work on the pipes underneath, and we put everything back the way it was before. This is an old city. Yes, I can tell you that no, there is a lot of changes. I am aware. And you're going to see it. Yes. So, uh, However, I, 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 I still haven't seen, I don't know if there's, Monsieur Sam can put, perhaps enlighten us, but I don't think there's an official policy on this. Whereas other cities have done this. Um, a good example, which I would encourage everyone to, to check out, is um, in Ottawa, uh, a city not very far from here, as you know. Uh, they, the city has a policy now that systematically, if they do major road work, meaning they dig up, they do, they change the sewers, they do a reconstruction, they have to now put in some kind of something for bicycles. And so they did uh, something called they did cycle tracks, so bicycle paths that are raised above uh, the street level, one on each side of the street, and which is prohibitively expensive to do. You can't. As a, to do as a retrofit, you could never do this. Just to, you could never add this to a street because you have to change how the sewers are. But if you're changing the sewers already, well, then that's a great time to do it. So um, I would, I would really like to see this kind of an approach uh, in Montreal. And then thirdly, lastly, if I may, um, another thing that we could take inspiration from. Thank you. Uh, from uh, New York City is also to try to do more things as pilot projects. And this is a nice way to assuage some of the political uh, pressure against doing things for cyclists. Is you tell the residents, we're going to do this for a year, we're going to make a bike path, we're going to put in some planters, paint, some posts, and we're going to try something out. And it's something where we can easily remove, we can remove in a day or two, and uh, we'll see how it works. And if it works, you know, and often what happens in the experience in New York has been, this has been done as a pilot project. Sometimes little adjustments have been made after a few months. And then usually there's buy-in from the residents. Residents realize that this was not the end of the world, that everything still works. They can still get, get around in their cars and get to their houses. And they actually see, start seeing the benefits of the new infrastructure. So, <clears throat> I think that that, as a policy, that would be an interesting way uh, to systematically start using this kind of approach throughout the uh, throughout the city. I like the project, and basically, like you know, this year, you know, as you know, we had uh, we announced a new program of uh, pedestrian piétonisation de la rue that we started this year with the, with the program five streets and the city. But this is something you know we just put it in place. So this is something we're going to work on. Uh, sure, you know, for the years to come. Yeah, and, exactly, and the nice thing about doing this too is you can you can try it out, and then uh, if it works well, the next time you have an opportunity, you do major work, you do a, reconstruct a sewer or whatever, then you build, make it permanent. You know, so it's just I would like to talk about it because you know sometimes we we don't know what's going on in, in the in the city. I can tell you on every time we intervene on any road, on any streets, we evaluate. The street, if we can, uh, we, if we can change the street, for sure. Like you know, we're going on Saint Denis. Saint Denis is gonna come next year, and we know that Saint Denis it's a major uh, artery in the city. So we want to make a change, but like you know, we there is an emergency there, and we have to intervene probably in, in, in an emergency way because like you know, we have the 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 collector 
they move, they're really probably more than 100 years old there, and there is a risk. So sometimes, like you know, we have to intervene in, 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 in emergency measures, and in these emergency measures, like you know, sometimes we miss stuff. But when we plan at the city today, I can tell you, and I, I have a witness with me, like if you want, we do <laughs> evaluate every street before going to uh, renew that. Just to let you know, last year we changed some, like the asphalt and cement, we changed, we put in place 8,000 square meters of green space instead of the asphalt. This year we're planning to put 24,000 square meters of green space instead of asphalt. So in, in, the, in, the, in every intervention we're doing, we're thinking of making the street better, and more safer for everyone, especially for pedestrians. We start with the most vulnerable. Then I'll give you Thank you. We'll, we'll hear from Madame Gigat, and then we're going to open it up and, and start to hear from, from some of you folks. Yes, uh, because since we're talking of uh, equity and policies and what the city could, could do to uh, give more uh, accessibility to uh, comfortable and uh, yeah, to, to people who want to go ride their bikes. Um, there's a good example of what the, the city could easily, I think, very easily do to change. Uh, it's not on infrastructures, but it's uh, it's a uh, it might be symbolic. But speaking of equity, I'm, <laughs> I'm going back. I will go to my point. Um, when I got uh, elected, I went to have my uh, official picture taken at the, the city hall, and uh, they, when I arrived there, they offered me a card, which is would have been give, which is giving any elected person uh, a car park interior car parking for the whole four years. So that's worth a lot in old Montreal interior parking. And all the directors and high cow at the city of Montreal, they have free parking like this. And uh, many get paid, they, 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 they're giving, the city is giving them money because they use their own car uh, for going around while they're working. So we are collectively uh, subventioning, I don't know how it's subsidizing. Subsidizing the, the solo car way of life. Why can't I choose not to? I said I don't need it, I don't have a car, I won't use that parking place. Why can't I ask for a free uh, monthly Opus card or my Pixie Pass for, for, for the season? It would be a lot cheaper than the, the, the worth of that parking place. But this, this is not happening. So if you want to be work if we talk about equity that that could be a simple way to have a strong statement so folks at, at this point we're gonna we're gonna open it up so if you've got something to say just maybe raise your hand flag me down I'll come with uh, with the traveling mic uh, feel free to either say your piece uh, or direct a question at some of the folks that are up here but certainly this doesn't have to be a linear exchange. So if you've got strong statements that you want to make and there's no question mark at the end, that's okay too. Uh, we got John over there. Thank you and thank uh, all the panelists. Um, I think it's actually the person from Fashion and Mori, I'll talk about how we have to look at it at a different scale. It's not just a question of bike paths and that. Although that's important to make sure that they're well done and they're well integrated. But I think we also have to look at it at a larger scale, even than just public transportation as a whole. We have to look at it from ecological, political, and economic uh, viewpoints. Okay. I, I've, worked in, I've worked as community organizer around questions of urban health. And in, in, uh, in, in that experience, I look at uh, you know, budgets from the provincial government. The provincial government has a $15 billion transportation budget five times more is put into road construction than public transportation. Now, we're not getting very far with a policy like that. Um, if we look at Turcot Interchange, right, that's a disaster in terms of, 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 of this whole notion of active transport and getting people out of their cars. The city of Montreal supported it. 
Same thing that's going to happen with the Champlain Bridge. There's going to be as many lanes of traffic there. They're interested in fluid. There may be an SLR there, but it's not discouraging people in terms of cars. Okay. So these, these are larger political and economic questions. Ecological questions. City of Montreal has a program or has an objective, 30% reduction of greenhouse gas by 2020. They're at 6% at the moment. Probably between 40 and 50% of that, those emissions are from cars. So these are not, you know, sort of anodyne questions. These are questions that are uh, of extreme importance, and I think everybody has to look at it from that scale also. I'd like to comment from people on the panel. Well, I do agree. And also, and also, it's a question of whose interests, right? Car manufacturers and oil companies are very interested in continuing to have cars on the road. Right? One can't forget those kinds of interests. Well, you know what? When we put in place uh, the structure of the Champlain Bridge, or even the structure of Bonaventure, or any structure, structure we're changing, we took in place. We, we had in mind the actual uh, fluidity, like you know, the cars running on the, in the streets, like the actual amount of cars today, and we changed this by what we have now. So we know by we know already, like you know, we have problems of, uh, of uh, traffic already today with what with what what we have. For sure, you know, I can tell you in 2009 when this when, when we decide to 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 support, like you know, there was another administration that support uh, Turcot. Today, what we had, we have, like you know, when when we do transportation, we do plan, we plan, we plan on seven, eight, nine years, and then when we execute, we execute within two, three years. The, on this planning, I can tell you today, like you know, I'm gonna change everything they did do before I arrive. I can tell you from today that every time we're acting on any measure in the city, we're taking care, we're taking in mind, we're, put, we're having in mind, you know, to make it better for, the, for our citizens and uh, to, to, to make it like, you know, um, more... We, that is, you have to understand too, we are not, we, we, I mean, we have a downtown in Montreal, which is a destination. And people has to come to the city of Montreal. They have to come for the economic development. They have to come to, we have to promote our streets, our commercial streets. And these destinations, like you know, it has people, they have to come. We don't want people to go to a distant or to any other shopping center. We need to have people coming to Montreal in the green way, probably, and probably uh, in a green way, public transportation, probably, or uh, electric cars hopefully soon. This is things we can do. Uh, now we're executing what has been planned before. Now we're planning for, for stuff coming. So we, in this planning, we're doing now the SLR, the on, on, uh, on uh, Champagne Bridge. And we wanted at least to, inter we want to introduce this through the history of the city of Montreal. We wanted at least to, we want to make this to pass into the heart of downtown. So uh, this is like something we're planning now. I'd like to take some, I can take some stuff like you know from the other administration that when they take their decisions. But at least when, what we're planning now, we're, planning, we're, we're aiming for better. Okay, anybody else want to answer that one before we pass it on to somebody else from the audience? Well, I mean, well maybe just real quick to, to for first of all, to, to sort of agree with what, what John was saying in terms of that there's, um, it is important to understand sort of first point in terms of that, that, that cycling is, it's so important to understand cycling in the sort of wider system that it has ecological, it has public health impacts, I haven't talked much about that, I mean, um, just very real population health impacts, um, uh, these environmental impacts. Um, and just the whole way we sort of design our cities, I think one of the things that's coming up that Bartek has been talking a lot about in terms of, you know, this, the place that we put up, the place we put for cyclists determines the way we design our cities with these very, very long-term impacts, um, which I guess also just speaks to, uh, to what IRF is talking about here in terms of um, 
I guess I'll say two things that sound kind of contradictory. I mean, one, I agree that the term God is, is a disaster, to use your term, um, but that it's kind of, uh, it was kind of a political inevitability. I mean, there was, um, there were all these different forces, um, a different administration, the, the MTQ, um, who's kind of, their job is to build highways and build bridges and build overpasses. And, and so there's a real kind of path dependency built into this process that, you know, if the church gospel falling apart, what do we do? We replace it. That's, that's what we do. And, and, and so there, that this was sort of put through the city. It's very hard for the city to, to refuse um, that to happen. There were other projects on it. True. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but my main point actually is that I agree that it is, it, it means that it's terrible for the city that they're building this with the same capacity or with, with you know, actually more capacity um, for, for vehicles. Um, and there was, there was very much of a lost opportunity here um, to completely, you know, the, a, a question could have been asked, you know, what's, what's our vision for the city? What's our vision for transportation? Uh, what's our vision for the ecological impact of our transport systems or the public health impact of our system? And, and these, these hard questions um, weren't asked or, or weren't, definitely didn't go in the right direction. So I saw a couple of, yeah, go, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, well, just a, sm uh, a small addendum to this discussion is that uh, what we fail to often recognize is that bicycle infrastructure is actually pretty cheap. And it's cheap because uh, it doesn't take up a lot of room. Uh, car infrastructure is wildly expensive. And cars take up an extreme amount of room and in dense urban areas there it's incredibly expensive to accommodate cars multi-level underground parking is wildly expensive and developers are actually trying to get out of having to build any if, if, if possible so you know actually accommodating more cyclists it, it's a more effective use of space and it's cheaper um, and I mean we have a, we have examples of this I'll give you an interesting example the Agence Métropolitaine de Transport um, recently built a vélo station, uh, 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 an enclosed bike parking at uh, one of the commuter train stations at De Montagne. This commuter train station has a 100% saturated park and ride uh, facility. The, the parking lot is jammed. And the only way they figured, they don't want to build multi-level parking because that would cost about 30000 or $40,000 per car. So instead, they built a high quality bicycle parking, hoping to incite more people to get there by bicycle. Um, the car, this parking facility, this Velo Station, takes up the equivalent of six uh, car spaces and accommodates 78 bicycles. And it costs approximately one and a half or two thousand dollars per bicycle. Okay, so compare that to thirty thousand dollars per car. Okay. And it takes up six, the equivalent of six car parking spaces. Yeah. I think that uh, as a, as as politicians with a, with a vision for Montreal, we need to uh, to be a, a, a changing. I don't know how to say a, a, a vehicle de changement. Uh, we need to help to change in people's mind that that idea that uh, good economy comes with uh, w huge car accessibility. We have to change that uh, that uh, score because uh, we, we will not have a, a visionary way of planning Montreal if we think it ourselves and we will not do it if we encourage, encourage that vision in people's mind. We need to change that. How do you say school? Discourse. Oh. <laughs> we need to change that discourse and we need to help people and show them examples of how a, a very good economy can, can be achieved and uh, enhanced uh, without that huge car accessibility and with alternative way of transport. I'm thinking of uh, Bordeaux, Montpellier, Strasbourg, and which are, have huge city centers that are almost car free and the economy is doing very well. So, yeah. Thank you. We're going to open it up. Uh, there's a whole lot of hands, uh, and I'm conscious that if we keep going back and forth, 
that we're not going to get a chance to address everyone's concerns. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go around, take a couple of points and questions that, that folks have, uh, and then we'll get you folks to answer to uh, not necessarily the things that are easier to answer, but but maybe you'll you'll get a chance to synthesize a little. Okay, good enough. And you know what? Maybe when when you're when you're talking, if you could just tell us your name and and if you're representing somebody, who that is as well. Okay. I'm Claudia, and uh, I was just wondering about the universality of banking. Um, I, I don't think it's possible in terms of, uh, I, well, as banking is I mean, a tool to, okay, to, to move, but then it's, there's a danger associated to banking, whether you feel like it or not. You know, it cannot be like walking since you're on two wheels, well then you you know, there, you can always fall. You can always, there's always something that can, that can happen. It's like basically being in a car. You know, you can always have an accident. Anything. So I don't, I don't see how biking can be universal as walk, like walking. I think it's, it's, it's a nice concept. Yet, yet, like you said in New York, you know, they have the lights and the stuff that can be called to biking. But then I don't, and you know, pregnant women biking. I don't know. Thank you. I think you, you wanted to say something? Okay, no, there's a couple of fellas in the back. Okay, I'll go around. C'est bon, la voix que vous apportez. Une question plutôt précise, parce qu'on a eu des concepts assez larges. En fait, j'aimerais juste avoir l'avis des panélistes sur la possibilité éventuellement de permettre aux cyclistes et aux piétons d'utiliser un feu rouge comme un stop. En fait, c'est utilisé dans certaines villes, c'est une mentalité qui porte à dire on n'est pas aussi dangereux qu'une voiture en mouvement, donc euh, lorsqu'il n'y a pas personne qui est en train de traverser euh, une voiture, un cycliste peut prendre la liberté, peut prendre le jugement de traverser la, le feu de circulation de façon responsable. Est-ce que c'est une avenue que la Ville pense peut-être un jour éventuellement aller vers la <rire> Est-ce que Vélo-Québec euh, défend cette idée-là? Est-ce que les différents partis sont intéressés à ce genre de comportement-là? Je pense que c'est quelque chose qui a été utilisé dans certaines villes, mais qui est rarement discuté, euh, je crois, là, dans, les, euh, dans les options. En tout cas, je n'ai jamais entendu parler de ça à Montréal. Donc, euh, voici la question. Et surtout comprendre que la question est destinée à moi. Ah, euh, la, la vie des panélistes en général. Et juste, on va prendre un instant, on va prendre une autre question. We're going to take one more and then we'll get you folks to, to respond. OK? Uh, Hi, my name is uh, Yann Rennichon. I'm a spokesperson for the organization uh, Sentier Royal. Um, who we are, basically, we're mountain bikers, and what we want to do is uh, legalize, but also regulate mountain biking on the Mont Royal. Uh, so it's kind of apart from uh, all, all the other questions, uh, mainly because Montreal is the last uh, large city in North America without any mountain biking infrastructure. And it's been done elsewhere with great success in regards of quality of the environment as well as safety for all the users. And I'm talking about larger cities with more people and even more sensitive natural spaces. Toronto has done it terrifically well. Even New York has done it. So what do you think about this project for Montreal? Thank you. Okay, so we We've got three questions that are a little bit different, but I trust you folks will be able to tie it all together. Um, who wants the first crack at answer? Go ahead. Uh, okay, so I'm going to try to do all three really quickly. First question. First uh, question. Um, I don't think we're anyone at this. I think I speak for everyone when we're saying we're not trying to force anybody to bicycle. What we're trying to do is just give people more options. So the idea is that it's not that you, anyone will be, you know that the bike will ever become the only option available to you. I mean, right now, we only have a few percent of people who use a bicycle to get to work and to school, for example. So the idea is only to make it more of a viable option. You know, and of course, like that doesn't mean that as a pregnant woman, you would have to be, be obligated to bike. You would have other options, hopefully, as well. Uh, as for uh, the second question, I'll answer in, in English. The question was about Idaho stops, which is uh, the idea that um, in Idaho, the state of Idaho, a rural state, in rural areas, they allow you to blow a red light. You can, you can treat a red light like a stop sign. Um, <clears throat> I think that this would be 
very difficult to um, to convince. Uh, it's it's actually the province which writes the highway code. Um, Vélo Québec would like the highway code to eventually be changed into something called a street code, which would be a code which. Uh, which begins with the pedestrian and ends with cars, rather than beginning with cars and ending with pedestrians as sort of an add-on to uh, cars. What Ville Quebec does, however, support is what uh, Paris and several French cities have done, is allowing right turns on reds, which right now you can get a ticket for in Montreal. So I, we think that that's something that a cyclist turning right should, should be allowed to treat a red light uh, like a, um, uh, like a stop sign, uh, that would be uh, in France. It's done. It's not a blanket thing. It's actually done punctually. So they add a little symbol to intersections where that kind of thing is allowed. So we think that that would be we're, we're in favor of that kind of a measure. Um, and then lastly, mountain biking. Um, Vélo Québec and myself personally, <coughs> I actually wrote a report for for Les Grands Parcs de, de Montréal uh, on this very subject. Um, we support, we think that uh, mountain biking should be um, legitimized on Mount Royal. If it isn't ever legitimized, there will be, always be clandestine mountain biking. And uh, at the risk of damaging sensitive natural areas on Mount Royal. So we think a much better and positive approach would be to do, for instance, what Toronto did in the ravines is to create formal mountain biking trails which will be properly upkept, which will be safe for their found, uh, bikers and which will channel the mountain biking and avoid damaging uh, the sensitive natural areas. So, and, and Mount Royal uh, makes sense, it's central, it's one of the major topographic features, but mountain bikers want top topography, they want, uh, they want uh, a bit of uh, uh, you know, the uh, nivellation, change of uh, level, um, and we've also noted that you know the nearest alternative, the nearest mountain biking station to, to downtown Montreal is about 50 kilometers away. It's, it's Romont and, and Rigaud are the nearest places to go mountain biking. So there is a demand in the city. There are people in the city who would like to have easier access to that, not have to drive 50 kilometers somewhere to be able to practice uh, mountain biking. Thank you. So we'll hear from uh, Madame Chigat. Well, I agree with every word uh, that I've just said. Uh, as uh, for the mountain biking, uh, I have to say that it's not uh, a Projet Montréal uh, line. I, I think that for now, well, we haven't discussed that, uh, that subject yet uh, inside the, the caucus. Many people are going to be very hard to, uh, to uh, Convince about about this because they have uh, very good concerns. But I'll try to uh, to speak uh, for for you guys because I kind of agree with your ar arguments. Um, as for the uh, Idaho stops, um, even as as a cyclist, I would love this to happen, of course. <laughs> but I I don't think uh, that the the mentality of uh, drivers, car drivers, uh, is ready for that right now. How, how things are, I, I really speak with what I, what I really feel for now. Um, we, as, as uh, riding our bikes, we, we experiment uh, aggressivity uh, from the, 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 the car drivers many times a week. It, it happens, it happens a lot during the winter. And in the spring, it's, it's, well, it's exploding, but it's not that bad, you know, it's not. But still, I think that uh, since right now we are uh, positioned as antagonists on the <coughs> idea of using the street, if the Code la Route would be changed and that, that radically, uh, many car drivers will just hate us more. I know it's a minority, but still, I think that the changes should come a lot more gradually, as, uh, and that the people going around in cars have to accept the idea of having more and more people on bike sharing, sharing the streets, 
before that we get to something that is quite uh, audacious. audacious? What, what about right turn on red, Maria? What, what's no, the that, that's, that's fundamental, I think. <laughs> that's a, that's an easy one. Mr. Stalin, Mr. Bono, would you like to respond to the questions that were asked? Uh, well, I'll be honest, I don't have much more to say. I think, I think Bartek did a great job of kind of <laughs> all, all those things. I, 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 I mean, I agree that I think um, um, I, yeah, we'll leave it to more. Well, I'm going to answer Claudia first. Uh, I think, um, you know, we have the, the responsibility at the city to uh, to respond to a demand. We know that people, they're using their bikes and we want people to use their bikes. It's, it's much better for the health, it's much better for the environment, it's much better for the, you know, for the community. It's even much faster than a car. If you were going to, from Plateau Mont Royal to City Hall, like it's, it's like, we can do it faster than a car, especially with the, uh, with the words that's coming this year. So, uh, <laughs> we have to, we have the, the we have to respond to a demand, and we cannot force anyone to take any. We cannot force anyone to go on a bike if he doesn't want to. But the city has the responsibility and to, to offer the most secure bike paths that we can have. Uh, for the and I know it's like you know touchy a bit because my answer is like more official, but I'm gonna tell you like you know my personal personal feeling. And I'm probably gonna go on, I'm gonna work with the services if, if we can do any changes. Uh, for the stop it out, or even turn right. Uh, personally, we, we're aiming at the city to have, we, we have a vision of zero accident. We're gonna try not to have any accident. I know we're like, you know, we topic with this, but anytime we, we intervene, we intervene with this vision. And we had it in this our, in our transportation plan. That we said within 10 years we're going to drop by 40 percent the accidents uh, on uh, pedestrian and cyclists, uh, the accidents on the city of Montreal. After five years, we we did half of the road where we decreased by 20 percent these accidents. Now, if we have we have to document it, to documentate these uh, this issue, we have to see like you know the accident that it happens in the city of Montreal. Does it happen because of that, let's say? If this is not the reason, and we can, we can do it, we have to convince the government, as uh, Barak said. Yeah, Bartek. Bartek, sorry. As Bartek said, it's, uh, we have to convince the government to at least let us do it under Project Pilot, probably. So we're not, you know, we're not, we can't, we're not gonna take any uh, judgment like, before uh, going on, on studying and documenting the, the, the issue. Um, and exactly the same thing for the Santé. Personally, I think we should we should do something more uh, more de rond un peu tranquille plus le vélo sur la montre sur Mont Royal. Il est certain qu'actuellement on va d'une façon uh, non légitime. On prend des non et puis il y a des gens qui, qui, qui sont un peu partout dans Mont Royal. Si on veut vraiment avoir quelque chose qui répond à un besoin, parce qu'on a l'obligation de répondre à un besoin. Euh, il faut l'encadrer pour préserver nos milieux naturels. C'est quelque chose, personnellement, je ne peux pas parler euh, au nom de mon collègue euh, Réal Ménard qui est déjà euh, saisi du dossier, mais au moins, personnellement, je peux vous dire, je ne suis pas fermé à l'idée, il y a moyen de faire quelque chose avec, et il faut l'étudier un peu, il faut aller plus en profondeur là-dedans avant de pouvoir s'étudier. Merci, Monsieur I think we're going to have to start thinking about wrapping it up. So, my question concerns probably more the logistical, um, con uh, I guess, logistical issues of um, having more bikes on the road and possibly more cars on the road with the Turcotte Yards and, and the Champlain Bridge. It's the idea of the asphalt. And the fact that we have massive amounts of potholes in Montreal, and historically, um, the the infrastructure for this has been, um, so to say, the talk of the town. 
Um, so I, I'd like to know how we will tackle that issue. Have engineers been consulted with regards to the composition of the asphalt? Have there, any, have there been any um, case studies done on this? And what will we do to improve that situation? The question is for me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and actually, and if you want to just hold on a second, we're going to take a few more and then we're going to show you yeah, that. No Hi, so my question sort of goes back to some of the things you said earlier uh, about pilot projects and doing implementation to learn and to sort of, uh, I guess, debunk some myths maybe and find out um, you know, what, are, what are the outcomes going to be when you, when you try something out because there's a lot of resistance to, to change. And also something that you said about um, uh, sort of inviting users um, into the planning process, and uh, you know by sort of acknowledging that that even local re residents um, are you know a form of expertise. Um, so I kind of want to ask you, and I guess maybe whoever wants to, to answer, um, like what 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 do you recommend? Like a, like a citizen group like ours, like NDG uh, Cyclist and Pedestrian Association, um, you know how do we get involved? And how do we get involved in, in uh, you know, coming up with ideas for pilot projects, um, and yeah, and, and you know, help plan them and help carry them out, and um, yeah, how do we get involved? Thank you. Bonsoir. Mon nom est Kadim, je représente le comité d'agriculture. Ce que moi j'aimerais beaucoup plus vous demander, depuis le début, on parle beaucoup d'infrastructures, de politiques pour, pour développer les vélos à Montréal. Mais il y a un problème qui se pose fondamentalement, c'est que nous constatons pendant des périodes de grande influence que nos vélos ne sont pas en sécurité. Et, et, oui, je vais bien utiliser un vélo, mais quand je le prends d'un endroit A à un endroit B, que je veux, euh, je veux le parquer, comme on dit, il se peut que je revienne dix minutes après et que... <rire> Il y a des parties manquantes sur mon vélo. Qu'est-ce que euh, vous comptez euh, faire principalement pour, euh, pour rendre plus sécuritaire l'utilisation des vélos Parce que si, si c'est moins sécuritaire dans ce cas-là, bah, ça ne sert vraiment à rien que je prenne mon vélo parce que je n'aurai plus rien pour me déplacer après. Merci. 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 Ok, so we have, uh, we'll, we'll give you a the last question and we'll, we'll throw it back at the other, other speakers. Yeah. My name is Derek from Alliance of Pedestrians and Cyclists of Southwest Montreal and uh, this is one of the major issues I've been following the last bunch of years and one of the questions people asked before was what is the city doing? I'll just give you a quick review. There's been a Commission Permanente de Culture et Loisirs et Sports. They've had uh, Montreal Physiquement Active. They've had a permanent commission on Partage de Réseau which was discussing how we can share the space and the street. They've also had the uh, Commission Traversée de la Rue, and of course the last one is the CSR that's going on throughout Quebec. So there has been a few movement, a substantial movement by the part of the city, and as well as the elected officials in the Société Civile. My question is uh, with regards to accessibility to the network. Um, there's been many former cities that were merged into one central city called Montreal. They had their own networks that were okay for the suburb that they represented, but we now are there are different ones that are part of this central network that is called Montreal. I'm wondering if you could tell me what the efforts are of the city to link former suburbs of, say, Saint Laurent, La Salle, Verdun, Montreal North, uh, Saint Leonard, into this full integrated network. And what is the city doing with regards to an axe north sud from the back river to the Fleuve Saint Laurent? Thank you. Thank you. So, throwing back at our panelists. Um, Mr. Sam, you, you wanted to answer one question before you want to. Okay. Um, we, all agree, we all agree on one thing at the city that we had the lack of investment that happens for the last I don't know how many years. And we did do. Uh, we did look at that basically last year. And we know uh, we're putting a plan for the next 10 years. So we make the streets much better than what it was today. The problem of the potholes, it's an infrastructure problem. You know, like there's the street usually there is a bed with cement. When the bed is not good anymore, whatever you do on the street, 
uh, you're gonna have potholes all over the next 10, 20, 50 years. So basically, there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be redone. And what we did last year, we put in place a program of $50 million for two years, which is $100 million for the boroughs. So the infrastructure, the, the streets that the bed is really well done, but the asphalt is not good, we're gonna just take out the asphalt and put in place a new asphalt instead of changing the whole street. By that, we can at least add five, 10 years to, to the streets, uh, five or 10 years to the, uh, to the age of the street. This plan, if you put this in place, plus what we're doing on the infrastructure, because we don't have the, capa the, the capacity to change the 4,400 uh, kilometers of streets that we have in, in a few years. So we're gonna have at the end a better streets in Montreal, and we're gonna continue, but it's gonna take 10 years. We have, it's gonna take a lot of efforts, efforts and a lot of money to, to put this in place. We have a plan to do it, and hopefully we're gonna achieve this plan by 10 years from now. I don't know if we're gonna be there, but at least we're putting the assets now for the next year, 10 years to go. Uh, pedestrian, cyclist, I know, you, you know, like, I, I guess you know me. We worked together on, uh, we had a few meetings together on issues like, you know, it does interest you. And you can see that, you know, we, we work, we're really open, we participate on elaborating uh, uh, programs or like, you know, some solutions to any uh, challenges we have, like the one we have on the Unknown Danger Zone. I can probably tell you you know, there's there's a lot of forums. There's you have probably to have some uh, structured projects, and you can submit to the city. Uh, you can we can we work like you know the city. It works with a lot of partners. One of our partners is Velo 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 Quebec. Uh, we work a lot with them on many many issues. They do a lot of studies. Basically, like tomorrow we can we're voting a fifty thousand dollars contract with them to uh, to give us like you know a study about the site in Montreal. Uh, for the next 18 months. So this kind of things, uh, we have to be structures, we have to have an idea, and we have to promote this idea. You know, changing the culture is not easy. Uh, change, telling the, 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 uh, the employees of the city of Montreal uh, that in 2015, they're gonna start cleaning the snow on the street, on the bike paths, uh, it's not easy. But at least, it's, it, when you put something in place, it's an idea that it came, we put it in place, we're gonna work on it to make it better, and it's gonna take time to be like, you know, fully operated. But it's probably with the new ideas that you have, that you can bring, that you can promote, through forum of discussions, through elected officials. You come to see us, like, you know, with your ideas, and we can discuss it. Is it can we make it better? Can we include it in, I don't know, and the uh, transportation plan that we have? It's, we can find a way, at least, to bring some new ideas, and we need these new ideas at the city. Sometimes, you know, when, when we work on, 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 on some issues, we probably we get uh, involved too many, like too much involved in something that we can't see anymore the big uh, picture. So, with with our partners, we can do uh, we can do something you know better for the city. Uh, pour le vol des vélos. Ça, j'aimerais vous répondre une question bien précise puis bien calculée, mais ça c'est un problème, c'est un, un, un problème qui existe à Montréal et il faut à un moment donné trouver une solution. Euh, ça c'est une des choses, on a déjà un comité vélo qui a été mis en place, mais qui n'ont pas réussi à faire grand chose euh, parce que effectivement il y a 20 000 vélos qui se, qui se volent par année à Montréal et il y a une matière à réflexion. Il y a une matière à voir comment on peut procéder. C'est sûr, ça revient à la personne de prendre toutes les précautions possibles pour que son vélo ne soit pas euh, volé. Euh, mais il reste que identifier un vélo, c'est extrêmement difficile pour un policier d'identifier un, un vélo volé à Montréal. Donc, il y a une matière de réflexion, enfin pas la porte, tellement ouvert. Euh, mais si vous avez des idées, alimentez-nous. On est prêt à prendre les bonnes idées. Derek, I thank you because you know that like, you promote what we did at the city. And uh, uh, you know, you were talking about uh, 
the servers like uh, Saint Laurent, Pierrefonds. In the plan that we have, we know that people from these areas they don't come to the downtown, you know, taking the cars, uh, taking their bikes. Even though if there is people from Saint Laurent that I know uh, that they come to Montreal on a bike every day uh, and it them, it take them in winter time around 30 minutes to get there. But I know that, you know, that not much people will do it. So the network that we have, we're trying to link this network, you know, to the one that brings people to the city for the people they want. But we know that people, they should use the bikes for an intermodal. So they can go to the train station, they can go to a, a metro station, they can park their, car, their, their, uh, their bikes there, and they can take another facility. So we need these people to leave their cars at home, to use the bikes, at least to use the tra public transportation. And this is like, you know, the way we're planning the, the, uh, the, the infrastructure, the network on the suburbs now. Hopefully one day we can see people coming from Ibizar to, to downtown. It's, we, we know that it's not gonna be like 90% of the population. So when, this is the plan that we have. If you're talking about the Axe North Sud, we had a plan, and oh, I don't know. We're working with the CP, just like to be politically correct, on this Axe. Uh, and this Axe, it's not just for Montreal, it's 140 kilometers. We're working this with, basically with Velo Quebec. We're working with them on this plan. Uh, we have some challenges, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm a person which is like positive in my <laughs> approach, so hopefully we can have something done. Uh, we were trying to do this last year, we didn't have the chance to do it. We even voted for a contract. At least we're gonna start the first uh, section on the north of the, of, the, of the island. It didn't happen last year, but hope I'm positive you know, in, my, in my life, so hopefully we can change things with, uh, with the city. <clears throat> I, I would like to follow up on uh, two, uh, two, two of the items that M. said and touched on, um, and they're related. Uh, first of all, there was a question in French about uh, bicycle theft, and what can the city do about it? Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, there aren't any too many satisfying answers. There's no magic solution to bicycle theft. It's a nagging problem around the world. Uh, the city certainly can, uh, I think, can and should do a lot more uh, about providing uh, quality bicycle parking in the public realm. And this is particularly a problem downtown and on many commercial streets where it's really difficult to, to find uh, bicycle parking, despite the city has made considerable efforts. And I, and I was the previous and the current administration and the boroughs as well have added more bike uh, bike racks, and they've added the the donut racks on the on the parking posts and so on. But we need to we need even more. Um, so that helps the problem partly. If if you're locked to a solid, properly built bicycle rack, that reduces some of the risk. And as Mr. Sanem said, part of it is also sensitizing cyclists on you know how to use better better equipment, better locks to properly lock their bicycles. However, another avenue I think that's interesting for the city uh, to pursue further is to construct more uh, secure bicycle parking. Um, the city of Montreal does have one such facility at, at uh, Lionel Guru at the metro station, uh, which is similar to the one I described earlier in uh, De Montagne. It's a enclosed uh, bicycle parking facility which you use your carte opus to get into. And so it's only people who have a key on their carte opus who are allowed in. So that considerably reduces the risk. This is especially, I think, interesting for people who are using the bicycle as a mode of access to public transit. So if you get to public transit, you leave your bicycle there all day. Um, I think it's important to have the peace of mind that your bicycle is secure. It's safe from the elements as well. It's not getting rained on and so on. And, uh, and it, the likelihood of it being stolen by anyone is greatly reduced because uh, there are, you know, there's surveillance in this bicycle uh, facility and also access is controlled. Um, and I would like to highlight that this is particularly an interesting way to uh, develop bicycle use in the more suburban parts. 
of the city, such as Ile Saint Laurent, for example, and some of the, the other uh, remote, remote boroughs that were mentioned. Um, indeed, as Monsieur Salem said, what we know about bicycle commuting trips is that they're generally, 80% of them are less than five kilometers long. So I don't think we're, we're the aim is not to have people commute to downtown Montreal from Saint Anne de Bellevue. Uh, the, uh, ro but rather, I think the aim should be that people who live in Saint Anne de Bellevue can get to a commuter train station by bicycle, leave their bicycle there, and then take the train to town. And then perhaps, if to take an idea from the Dutch, uh, well, somebody who comes downtown on a um, on the train can also use the bicycle for the last mile, as they say, the last mile problem. They get off the train downtown and they use Bixi to get to their work, or perhaps if there were high quality secure bicycle parking, they could use their own private bicycle as well to get to their final destination, if, maybe if there isn't a Bixi nearby. Um, and I would note that this has actually been done in Toronto uh, at their Union Station, which is their equivalent to our Gare Centrale. They have uh, 300 uh, capacity, 300 bicycle space parking and it's actually mainly used overnight, so, it, 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 so it, which indicates that this is, it's people who commute to downtown Toronto and then use their, have a private bicycle, which then they use to get to their final destination. So um, I think these are interesting avenues uh, for the city to explore, and secure bicycle parking is a key question in this, uh, in this, in this avenue. Thank you. So uh, we've got a, a few more minutes before we uh, we close it up for the evening. Um, is, is there anyone who, here who hasn't spoken uh, and who's got kind of a, a, a burning thought that's on their mind that they'd like to share with us? So we've got a couple of hands. Um, we're going to go to you first. Hi, my name is Brenna. I'm here with 12 Books. Um, I also have a small company called Girl 6 Libre Raison. It's a bike courier. Um, my question is regarding police strategy and cyclists in Montreal, it's really important to me. Um, I feel unsafe with my bike here at night. I, if I have to go from, say, Park X to St. Henri, where I live, I'm always thinking about scenarios on René Levesque regarding police and red lights and my personal safety. Um, I have a friend who's Lebanese. He's been stopped for running a red light and had three cars of backup call for him. He's 18 years old. These scenarios uh, don't give me confidence in my new career choice as someone who lives to bike now, and extends beyond commuting to work or um, being a student, um, but is essentially living on my bicycle as my means of support. Um, yeah, I'm just interested in strategy and evolution of the current quota system that I believe I feel criminalizes youth on bicycles who need to bike to live. That's mostly directed at the city official, but please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you, Steve uh, Avia for the Coalition de Lone Royale. Um, everyone's been assuming here that the bicycle trip is to downtown. And in fact, there's a lot of people who ride bicycles in the suburbs who are staying in the suburbs. And if we actually made it easy for them to get around, not necessarily to the rail station, and this is another topic, you know, a park and ride lot is not really development around the rail station. Like, if you want to actually create value there, you should be creating mixed uses where people live, work, it's a destination in and of itself. A parking lot is just a huge dead space. But anyway, uh, a final point is we've been talking a lot about all kinds of interventions, generally on an ad hoc basis as things are being done, you know, as the streets being renovated, as the sewers being renovated. But I think this, the cities that have succeeded in creating good cycling infrastructure have done it from a, a systemic perspective. Like we really need to be creating systems of mobility where people can move throughout the city. And if you're moving by foot or by bicycle, you're not coming into conflict with a car at every single intersection. So you actually have a network of, of roads, if you will, but they're really places that cars are not going in. So pedestrians can move along them. They can get really to any place that they need to get to but they're not incessantly at every single intersection coming into conflict with cars. And once again, the, the, the benefit of the city is it brings people together, like a place for people to mix. So the streets are actually the most important public space of a city. So giving over 80% of that space to cars 
and you know, 30% of that space for parked cars is a huge waste of a very, very valuable resource. So if we really need to be looking at our major arterials, like that's where cyclists want to go. That's where people want to be. You know, having parking on these streets, on these places, like Saint Laurent, Saint, uh, Saint, Saint Denis, Saint Catherine even, these are places that we really need to start thinking about how we use the public domain for these places. And is, it, is giving a huge amount of space to cars a good use of that space? And yes, they pay parking meters maybe. But in that space, how many times have you seen a car go into a shop? You know, that's not really, <laughs> that's not what is creating wealth. And Montreal is competing with the distant. Like there is regional development. That the region of Montreal is growing and that growth is off the island, unfortunately. You know, and if we're not making Montreal, like Montreal cannot compete with free parking. Like we really have to compete on other things. We need to create a place where people want to come, are comfortable being here, can get around, and basically is a place that they can get away from their car. So how can we do, like in my opinion, I think we need to really be looking at a systemic approach. You know, how can we integrate St. Catherine into a corridor? Like that entire corridor is gonna link up with another corridor of Saint Laurent, Saint Denis. Like we're gonna actually create a network where people can get around the city without needing to be in a car, without even needing to be in public transportation. It would be a pleasure to navigate these spaces. And sorry, I'm just gonna okay. ask you to wrap it up because okay. we're out of time. And so basically, how can we create a network? Basically, in terms of the planning, I think we really need to be focusing on network effects. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, who wants to? Kevin, is that a head nod? Um, well, that, no, I mean, I'm being just quick because we're all kind of having to wrap up. I mean, Steve made some very good points there. Yeah, I think that that's great just uh, in terms of both the first point about that, yeah, that not everyone wants to come downtown, that there's lots of room for people to be cycling um, in other parts of, of the city, other parts of, of the region. Um, that we should all be aware of people who are making these decisions, these policy decisions. And, and I think. Partly, I guess, to go back even to the first thing I said in, in the sort of introductory comments, you have this idea of, of you know, network based and also you know, that it's not always about new infrastructure, it's, it's about just getting, getting everyone to kind of understand um, that there's more cyclists out there and, and the people interacting better and um, that, these, that these, these projects don't have to be expensive and, and based on you know, complicated and, and expensive infrastructure, but just getting cyclists to feel more and more comfortable um, on, out in, in the world, on the streets that, that, are, that are there. And um, the other, um, well actually maybe go back real quickly, just because I guess we're kind of wrapping up, but the getting, the, the point about the, the parking, the enclosed parking, it is, it is such an important part of, you know, the, a lot of research I've done, a lot of people who want to cycle or who do, but but aren't they cite that they, they, they don't feel safe, you know, with their either their bike overnight or, or throughout the day, and and the, and the kind of goes back to what Marianne was talking about earlier too about the sort of the city or companies can make a huge impact by by supplying um, free parking for for free enclosed parking, free safe parking um, for cycles uh, for for bicycles um, would be hugely important in terms of, of low cost. Um, effective solution to get more people cycling, more people comfortable about cycling. Thank you. And so, in, in, in fact, yeah, indeed, we, we are going to wrap it up. So, as, as we answer this last round of questions, I would also encourage my, my panelists to, uh, to introduce any last thoughts you might, you might want to share with folks. Um, I'm going to respond to two points that as he made, if I may. Uh, one is uh, ex excellent point about the suburbs. Uh, so indeed, not all, definitely not all trips are to downtown. There are many places of work in the suburbs. There are many destinations in the suburbs. People who live in the suburbs may want to go shopping near their houses and so on. And indeed, uh, in many ways, it's even more challenging because many of Montreal's suburbs were built around the car. And uh, the suburbs are cut inter by by freeway corridors, which are very difficult and uncomfortable to cross as a pedestrian and as a cyclist. Uh, there, we also have quite a few railways, which are also difficult to cross or impossible to cross legally anyway on a bicycle. <laughs> so uh, as many of you may know. Um, so these are big challenges. Um, they're actually a, in many ways a different set of challenges than the challenges we have here in the more dense parts of the city, where I think the main challenge is that the space is highly contested 
every little every square meter of space is contested for different uses and um, um, uh, so uh, it's a different different set of challenges um, the other uh, point uh, what V was saying about networking I would actually in my view uh, the city has actually done a very good job they've made almost they're, they're actually the people who plan our bike paths are almost obsessed with networking to the point where they have missed opportunities to do uh, bits of bike path that wouldn't link up with the network. So the last, since it's about 2005, the, 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 a lot of the effort has been on linking up uh, bits of, little bits of bike bus paths here and there that were sort of alone and lost in space. And um, so I think that uh, that's not actually one of my biggest concerns, I think that I'm more concerned with not missing opportunities. So if, if an opportunity comes up when we reconstruct a uh, street that we try to uh, build something, even if it immediately doesn't link up with the network, that we first, we build it, we seize the opportunity, and then later we figure out how to link it with uh, the rest of the bicycle network. Um, and maybe as like a, just a quick wrap up, um, also something you touched on, like distant and so on, uh, now we're talking about 15, 40, you know? I think that uh, for downtown Montreal, the central parts of the city, I would include Plateau, Outremont, Rosemont, uh, the Centre Sud, Centre West, uh, Sud West, and that uh, these in these dense parts of the city, I don't think the way forward is to compete with Distant. It's it's to go in the opposite direction. So now, as we reconstruct Saint Catherine, as we rebuild uh, many of our of our main commercial streets, we have to offer something completely different. We'll never beat these top in terms of number of parking spaces for cars. So instead, we should go in a completely different direction and make these uh, spaces where you can access, that you can easily access by with many other modes of transportation, among which is the bicycle, but not only the bicycle. I'm gonna let the last word to my... Since I was the one who started. Yeah, yeah, it's just... <laughs> Light and I think <laughs> you've been working hard. You, you, you deserve the last one. <laughs> um, yes, just like uh, I want to talk about that idea of competing with the shopping centers and what kind of uh, commercial streets we want. As if, uh, as, as we said, uh, I, I, I suppose that if I would go to you, Aref, and say. We definitely need a large, uh, two, two lines of large bike uh, lines on Saint Denis. You, you would tell me it's impossible. No, no, no you would not yeah, because he never says so. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> try <trying> yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but maybe the provincial government would say it's impossible because Saint Denis is a provincial provincial street highway. highway. Uh, but uh, Saint Denis is right now. Uh, having lots of problems. The, the, the whole commercial artery that was Saint-Denis is, uh, is, is doing bad. Uh, people don't go there. And I kind of see why. But there are many, many, many reasons, and some of them are beyond our, our uh, powers. But on, when you go on, on Saint-Denis, you walk there, you, you don't hear what the other people next to you is, is saying, because the traffic is so high, and it's speeding up so much that the experience you get there is, is not very pleasant. So that's, that's, a, that's a reason for choosing not to go shop on Saint Denis, there are others, but that, that's one good reason. And if you go on Mont Royal Street, which is in the same borough, Mont Royal Street is at the opposite, is one of the, if not the best commercial artery right now, the, it's, it's doing very well, all the, new statistics are, uh, come, come, are telling so. And when you go on Mont Royal, there are still many cars, but not that much. And there's only one lane on, every, on each direction, and you can't speed on Mont Royal. Cars are going, going very slowly, which makes it a, a very more peaceful and quiet place to walk and be, and even on bike. It's quite safe to ride on Mont Royal because nobody speeds, and you just kind of go with it's almost a shared place now because it, the traffic is so 
found because of how it's configured or and it's doing very well so I, I think it, those example gives us a, a way of why we need to think our city not uh, as a, cent a, commerce or a shopping center but in as a, a milieu de vie a place where you live and you want to just feel comfortable uh, I wish I could tell you something about that police issue. Uh, I, I, will, I really wish. It's very, very, uh, well, I figure it's, it's another time something that is, well, anyway. I wish that police could be more uh, with us than against us sometimes, but they just apply the rules. So, and we can't uh, blame them for, for that, that specifically. So if, uh, if the code of security routier could be changed, uh, it would be easier for them to be, to be uh, nice with, with, with us, you know? And uh, that, that specific thing you said about uh, 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 a cyclist with a driver license is a lot more penalized by using those, I don't know how you call them, those points when you commit an, uh, some infractions on your bike. If the other cyclist doesn't have the driver license, he doesn't lose or get those, those points. So this is a huge inequity that should be changed, I think. Um, uh, yeah, well, to, 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 to wrap this up, um, that's a, that's a, too bad she, she left already, but I, w I wanted to say that I, uh, I, uh, I rode my bike through both my pregnancies and I felt uh, safe doing it and I'm not a superhero. <laughs> I'm just a, yeah, you know, and it, uh, I, think, um, I think that uh, sedentarity is way more dangerous than riding a bike. And it's, it's well <laughs> It's, it's well known that, well, you already know, but riding a bike, the bike is not dangerous, dangerous itself. It's the environment around it that makes it uh, dangerous, but you just don't fall from the bike. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you had a nice uh, evening at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Basically, I lost three listeners by, <laughs> by being the last one to talk. Uh, do you mind if I wrap it up in French? Just like to make some changes. Uh, <laughs> I will just respond. Oui, nous faisons des, des réseaux au niveau de la ville. Et quand je parle, par exemple, je parle de Saint Laurent, si je retourne en 2009, on avait 500 mètres de bicyclable en 2009. Cette année, nous avons 40 kilomètres. L'idée, effectivement, on, on pense qu'on a un pôle d'attraction d'emploi à, à Saint-Laurent. Il y a 110 000 emplois qui se font là-bas. Nous avons réussi à mettre des pistes cyclables dans, le, dans la zone industrielle et nous, nous sommes en train de connecter ces zones-là au secteur résidentiel de la ville pour que les gens qui veulent se déplacer en, en bicyclette, qui peuvent le faire, qui puissent le faire en bicyclette jusqu'à leur lieu de travail. En parallèle, on, veut, on sait déjà aussi qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui se déplacent vers le centre-ville, mais on veut que ce déplacement se fait par, euh, par, euh, par le mode le plus actif possible, si ce n'est pas, si pas fait à pied, parce qu'on est en train de construire des tottes à Saint-Laurent, on est en train de promouvoir la bicyclette comme un autre mode de transport que la route. Donc, on le fait. Je ne vais pas rentrer beaucoup sur le... Sur, sur, je vais vous donner juste l'exemple de Sainte-Catherine, mais il y a certainement des annonces qui vont venir. Nous sommes en train de travailler Sainte-Catherine d'une façon vraiment exemplaire, parce qu'on veut changer la ville, on veut changer notre ville pour que ça soit plus à l'échelle humaine, et Sainte-Catherine sera un projet phare dans ce changement-là. Il y aura des années de travaux dans cette, sur la rue Sainte-Catherine, on les fait avec les commerçants, on les fait avec tous les intervenants du milieu. On a fait des consultations des fois depuis des mois et des mois pour qu'on pour qu arrive à avoir un centre d'attraction 
n'ont pas pour les voitures, même si la voiture va toujours avoir la, la, la place, mais pour tout le monde ensemble. Et ça, je vais répéter peut-être. En tant qu'élu, que, qu j'ai l'obligation de trouver un point d'équilibre où tout le monde puisse se trouver. Et j'ai l'obligation aussi de rendre ma ville une ville à l'échelle du monde. Je veux au moins que les gens qui, qui choisissent de rester à Montréal, qu'ils aient une quiétude, qu'ils aient une qualité de vie qui est encore meilleure que ceux qui, veulent à Laval, qui, va, qui vont à Laval ou ailleurs. Donc j'ai cette obligation de le faire et je vais, nous, notre administration, je peux le dire, nous voulons ce changement et nous voulons le faire avec cette vision de rendre une ville à l'échelle humaine. On parle de milieu de vie, oui. On parle de milieu qui répond aux besoins de tout le monde, oui. On veut le faire chez nous et on veut le faire tous ensemble. Et juste pour finir, j'aimerais remercier tout le monde, qui, 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 au moins qui ont laissé jusqu'à la fin. Euh, C'est quand même deux heures de... qui sont vraiment, je pense, bien investies. Moi, ça m'a donné beaucoup d'idées, j'ai pris des notes. Il euh, y a des choses qu'on va amener, c'est sûr, au niveau de la ville, on va les penser. C'est dans ce genre de forum de discussion où on peut promouvoir ce que nous sommes en train de faire à la ville et surtout de, de, de se ressourcer de vos idées et de les amener euh, comme des acteurs de changement. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Donc, uh, yeah, just, just to, to finish, I'd like to first of all thank, warmly thank uh, our four panelists. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I'd like to. I also want to thank uh, the the School of Community and Public Affairs for convening this important, timely conversation, uh, and uh, as well as the volunteers who, who helped and uh, and led the project. And uh, and of course, I'd like to, to thank all of you for for showing up and making this a great evening. We'll see you on the bike path. Did, did, did you folks have anything you wanted to add, or? Yeah, thanks to you, of course. <laughs> and, and thank you, Alex. <laughs> and, and remember to visit the Quebec on the Move exhibition in the library building. It's on for another week. That's it. Thank you.